I think we probably have quite a lot in common, and one of the things we have in common is an admiration for Bertrand Russell. Um, could you tell me about how you met him? Originally, I heard about Bertrand Russell when he went to jail. He was protesting against the nuclear weapons, and he was arrested in 1961. When I read this in India, as a young man of 25, I said to myself, here is a man of 90 going to jail for peace in the world. What am I doing, young man, 25, sitting here drinking coffee? So I talked with my friend who was with me, and we said, let's do something to support Burton Russell. What can we do? Let's walk to Moscow, Paris, London, Washington, D.C., these four, four nuclear four capitals. Nuclear, yes. Yeah. And so we started to, uh, to decide that, and we wrote to Burton Russell, and he said, I'm delighted that two young men want to walk all the way from India to America, but please walk fast so that I can see you when you come to England. Because I'm, I'm 90. <laughs> because I'm 90, that's right. <laughs> so we started from the grave of Mahatma Gandhi, and we walked through Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, the former Soviet Union to Moscow, then uh, Warsaw, Germany, Belgium, France, and then French people helped us to cross the channel, and we arrived in England, and we met, met Bertrand Russell, and he was so pleased. He said, I'm so glad I'm still alive, and you walked <laughs> fast enough for me. <laughs> and then he helped us to uh, cross the Atlantic, and so uh, we arrived in uh, America. He gave you money to... to he, no, we said we don't want any money. We did entire journey from India to England without any money. No, in so our how, did you, how did you live? Just on hospitality of people. How wonderful. Everywhere people helped us, supported us, gave us hospitality, but not a penny. So we said to Bertrand Russell, we cannot take any money, because that is our vow, to walk as pilgrims, and so take no money. But we want to go to America, and we want to accomplish our destination. And so he said, I'll help you with the tickets. And so he helped us with two tickets in Queen Mary. How wonderful. Yeah. So we sailed across yeah. America in great luxury and arrived uh, in New York. And then we walked to Washington, D.C. Delightful story. He was a wonderful old man. I wish I'd wonderful, met him. Wonderful, wonderful. And when we met, we talked about everything, about China, India, Cuba, Wittgenstein, philosophy, everything. Yeah. So he was a wonderful man. Yeah. Now, you're very keen on holism, I yeah, know. Yeah. Holism is a word that I associate with General Jan Smuts. Yeah. Um, what does holism mean to you? Holism means to me is that things are connected. Nothing stands in isolation. So when you look at a tree, you don't, you don't just look at a tree. You know the tree exists only because there is a soil. Tree exists only because there is a sunshine. Tree exists only because there is air. So, so many things make the tree. So just looking at the tree in isolation, without the context, without the holistic view of the surrounding, will be wrong, in my view. So holistic to me means seeing everything in their context, in their whole perspective, rather than in isolation. That makes a lot of sense to me. But as a scientist who wants to actually understand how the tree works, yeah. I would be more inclined to dissect the tree, to think about the molecules of, um, of water going up the uh, transpiration stream yeah. inside the tree, yeah. think about the sun bearing down upon the leaves, which are kind of solar panels and are yeah. being used to, um, to catch carbon dioxide out yeah. of the air yeah. and, and so on. Um, how do you reconcile those two views of the there tree? There is no contradiction. Right. As long as you have in the back of your mind the context of the whole, and within that whole you look at the parts, the detail. So, de I mean, for example, you're writing a book. Book is made of every sentence, every word, every syllable, every line, every page. But page is not the book. You have to see the book in the context. But you cannot see the book in the context without reading the page. You cannot read the page without reading the sentence. You cannot read the sentence without reading the words. So details are important, but they, they are only important within the context of the whole. So if people don't take the holistic perspective and only reduce the book to a page or to a title, then that, I, I would say, is wrong. 
But if the title is to understand the whole, then that redu reducing the science to its particulars will be useful. So in my view, there is no contradiction. Right. Um, I would think I'd put exactly the same thing, but I'd probably use the word hierarchy and say that there is a hierarchy of units within units within units. Yeah. And in order to understand something, at any given level, there's no point going too far down into the details. Yeah. Um, so if you're, say, trying to understand how a computer works, for yeah. example, yeah. you know that the computer actually consists of integrated circuits, transistors yeah. and so yeah. on, yeah. but it doesn't really help you. What you do is you think in terms of large units of software interacting yeah. with each other, yeah. whereas if you're an engineer who's trying to repair the computer, yeah. well, if you're trying to repair the computer, you might well actually take out a whole integrated circuit board, in fact, yeah. but finally, you would agree that you can reduce it down to uh, ones and noughts, high voltage, low voltage states yeah. in a whole lot of uh, integrated circuits. Yeah. So that there is an explanation at all levels, but we have to think hierarchically. Hi I would not think hierarchically. I would think more in terms of network. So things are not higher or lower, but they are spread like a network. So. Uh, when I say holistically, network is a good example for that because one uh, unit will not stand by itself because it will fall down, it will break down. So in the same way, for example, if you take the tree, as I said in the example, tree is made of this network of elements which make the tree. If you take the sun away, the water away, the soil away, the gardener away, the forester away, there will be no tree. Tree is made of so many other elements which are not tree. So tree is made of non-tree elements. And that is why holistic view of the world is a kind of context within which particular detail, particular uh, aspect you can understand better. Yeah. Otherwise you are, uh, you are working. Why we have in the world today so much trouble? Because we forget the context and we just take one issue and just tackle that single issue as if everything else is irrelevant. And this is why I think we have many more uh, social crises, political crises. For example, in politics, we take just the terrorism as a separate element without seeing the context, or we see poverty as a separate uh, element without seeing the context. So without the context, text does not mean anything. Text needs context. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, I can see why one wants to say that the tree is an important part of the context of the tree. Yeah. It's in the soil, it's in the air, there's in the sun, um, in a whole ecosystem. Yeah, very complicated exactly. that exactly. ecosystem exactly. is. I'm not sure it's helpful to say that that's all part of the tree, however. I, I mean, that, to me, that's a slight misuse of language because although the tree is sitting in a context, which is an ecological context, yeah. and a soil context and so on, it's not actually part of the tree. You want to, to reserve the word tree for the wooden thing which has roots in the ground and has leaves at the top uh, and is planted in the ground. Yeah, but that's too simplistic. Just to reduce well, the tree to something that is roots in the ground and standing as a trunk and branches. Because we are, as a you scientist, and I as a philosopher, we want to go a bit deeper and a broader. We, want to, we don't want to just be simplistic. We want to say, what, there is no such thing as tree if you take all those elements away. Because the roots and the branches and the trunk are made of other elements. I think we're agreeing about everything that matters. I think that our disagreement is only semantic. Uh, I think that words need to be used in precise ways. And I no, fear I that think, that's not I a precise I think our difference is more than semantic. Okay. Our difference is quite basic because what I'm saying is there is no such thing as a tree in itself. Tree is only tree when we see the whole context in it. And we, if we, the moment you take the context away, there is no such thing as tree. Mm -hmm. Because we are stuck with tree, we lose the context and therefore we can cut a tree thinking there is no problem. But when we are cutting the tree, if we remember the context, we will be very careful when to cut, when not to cut, how to deal with the tree. So the context, the holistic perspective is very fundamental. Uh, whereas quite a lot of scientists, and I'm not saying yourself, but quite a lot of scientists go to a very particular reduced element 
and they work only on their specialist aspect. And I think there science goes wrong. Well, I think as a philosopher, probably, yes, I, I mean, I think we probably agree about that. And I mean, one was tempted to quote the sort of cliche about seeing the wood for the trees. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly, okay. exactly. Um, moving on to something else, um, I think spiritual is a word that you use a yeah. lot. What, 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 does, what does that mean to you? What I mean by it is that world is made of two elements. One element is visible element, what we can sense, we can touch, we can taste, we can look, we can smell, we can feel. That's one. The other aspect of creation or existence or universe is invisible dimension, things we cannot see. So, so what is that element which is invisible? I call it spiritual. So like you say, uh, there's a law, there is a law in letter and spirit. So letter you can see, you can read it, what is it? But interpretation, the spirit of the law, the meaning of the law differs according to the view of the, of the reader or the lawyer or the solicitor. So world, in everything in the world, the whole entire universe has these two layers, the material layer, the spiritual layer, and they are not separate. They are absolutely integrated with each other. So a matter cannot exist without the spirit, spirit cannot exist without the matter. Without matter, spirit is useless. What is the point of spirit? And without spirit, matter is dead. There is no, there is no uh, life to it. So that living force, that quality, is what I call spiritual. So, uh, so world is made of quantity and quality. Quality is spiritual, quantity is physical. Physical and metaphysical. These are the two elements which uh, are married together. The moment we separate them, then some people become spiritualists in a little ghetto, other people become materialists in a ghetto, and they quarrel with each other. I say matter and spirit are two aspects of the same reality, two sides of the same coin. But when you introduce that, you use the example of law, and you said there's the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. Yeah. And at that time, I understood that rather clearly. That yeah. The spirit of the law is something about attitudes in human minds, exactly. human minds being in human brains. Yeah. But then you said you can't have matter without spirit, and that there you lost me, because surely before there were human, or indeed, brains of any sort yeah. uh, around to, to think about things, yeah. um, there was matter, but there was no spirit. No, but uh, uh, spirit is not necessarily just human spirit. No, but, but before but there, there is any a, there's a spirit in the room. When you go in a room, you say there is a good feeling here. There is a spirit of ah, the room. Well, now you've changed to something rather different. The, the spirit is a very big and very holistic and very inclusive word. It is not defined in a one particular way. So when you go in a room, you can say the tree has a spirit. A, a rock has a spirit. It's a living rock for me, it's alive. Mm. The, the earth is alive. So the, the, the tree is alive. It's, it's a human, it's, the spirituality is not a monopoly of the human beings. Spirit no. is a very universal concept. Did you try any of that on Bertrand Russell, if I may ask? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I didn't no, try that. I don't that. think he would have liked that. No, that, no, that no. So but, uh, but I was only 26, 27 at that time, <laughs> and I was talking to a man of 92, yes. so I was a little bit uh, humble. Yes. Uh, but now I'm 70, I can talk a little bit more forcefully. <laughs> so what, what, what worries me about, about this is that you seem to me to be switching from one place to another, and it sounds as though you're using the same, indeed you are using the same words, yeah. but they mean something very different. The spirit of law is one thing, a spirit when you go into a room is another thing, yeah. the spirit in the tree is another, um, thing. is another thing, and probably in my view nothing. Um, so don't you think you run the risk of being misunderstood by people who will think that you're talking about uh, about ghosts, for example, I mean, in, in, in trees no, or... No, I'm not talking about ghosts, I'm no, talking don't you run about the, risk of being misunderstood? the quality. I'm talking about the quality. Uh, like uh, human beings have body, senses, organs, all the things we have, which anybody can understand, but there is a quality of a human being, which is very unique to each and every human being. And now that is spirit. So quality cannot be measured, quality cannot be analyzed, quality cannot be defined. It's something you feel, you understand, like your friendship. You cannot measure how much friendship I have, 
or, or uh, how much uh, uh, respect I have. You cannot measure it, but that's a kind of quality, and I call qualitative aspect of reality spiritual, and quantitative aspect of reality material. That's all I'm saying. Well, there are lots of things you might... Sorry. It's one thing to talk about a spirit of a human, and yeah. that humans are so complicated that yeah. what could mean all sorts of things, but you also said that rocks have a spirit, and yeah. um, that's, again, where, where you lose me. I, I fear that that's a misuse of words, because it's taking two very different things, a highly complicated thing like a human, or indeed a dog or a, or, or a kangaroo, which, yeah. I, which um, has a complicated nervous system, but a rock, how can a rock have a spirit? A rock has a spirit. Rock, you take a rock, and give it to Henry Moore, and he will turn into a beautiful sculpture. Where does that sculpture come from? The from Henry quality. Moore. <laughs> comes no, no, but Henry Moore could not make that quality by himself without the rock. Well, rock true. and Henry Moore are not too separate in that situation. They are like observer and the observed in relationship. So the rock has the spirit, and Henry Moore has the spirit. And th those two coming together, developing something, uh, emerging something, unfolding something, and that spirit has unfolded. Uh, a, a lump of um, uh, clay, you put it in the hands of uh, Bernard Leach, and he turns into a beautiful pot. There's a spirit of the pot coming out of that clay. So let us not uh, define the word spirit in a very narrow way. Let us understand the word spirit in a very broad way. And the broad meaning of the spirit is that, what is the quality of the clay? What is the quality of the rock? What is the quality of uh, a tree? What is the quality of a human being? What is the quality of a law? Anywhere, there is a quality and there's a quantity. There's a physic and there's a metaphysic. Those two work together. If you separate them and you just bring spirit as a kind of human domain or, or a kind of some other domain, then you are reducing spirit to a very low level. Whereas there's a universal spirit. The universe has a spirit. Oxford has a spirit. When you come to Oxford, you feel something different than if you were in London. So spirit is the quality of the place. Well, I can appreciate that on a kind of poetic level, and I can sort of, um, at a poetic level, if I'm walking through Western Ireland or something, yeah. I can feel something you would call a spirit of it. But I think I want to use words more precisely and say that the, the, the character of a person, the, the thing that a person has, that Henry Moore has, yeah, for example, yeah, yeah. Um, which he may then impose upon the rock with his, with his chisel, um, is a different kind of thing from the spirit which a place has or a rock has. And, and I worry that you're, you define things so broadly hmm. that you confuse yeah. by using the word in, in such widely different ways that it, that it doesn't actually mean the same thing. Yeah. It doesn't mean the same thing, but it still has a kind of... When you say human spirit, and other times you say spirit of the law, and other times you say universal spirit, of course it has a different meaning. So I'm not saying that it's the same meaning. When you say there's a friendship between husband and wife, and a friendship between a father and a son, and friendship between two other unrelated individuals, there are different kind of relationships. Nevertheless, there is a friendship. So in the same way, I would use the spiritual quality of everything in a broad way. I'm not a scientist, I'm a philosopher, uh, or, or to some extent I'm an I'm environmentalist. I want to understand the quality of everything. And because we have become so materialistic and we are not re having regard to the spiritual aspect of everything, uh, we use the matter in a very disrespectful way. And therefore we are not even materialists because we don't use the matter with respect. If we consider the rock has spirit, tree has spirit, we will have a kind of respect for the rock, for the forest, for the rivers. We will not pollute them. We will not um, destroy them. We will not create global warming if we had a spiritual attitude towards the universe. We will have a kind of humility, ecological humility, because we have a spiritual values. But when we see matter without spirit, and a spiritless matter, then use it as you like, just for the human use.
What's the point in it? And therefore, we destroy the forests, we destroy the oceans, we destroy the rivers, we destroy the land, we kill the animals, we become so cruel. So spirituality gives you a kind of humility. That's why I want to use the word spiritual in a very broad sense and not in a narrow sense. Well, let's end as we began with agreement. Um, I want to agree with you very strongly. We do not want to pollute the world. We don't want to cut down the forests. Yeah. Uh, we don't want to cause global warming. We want to avoid all those things. Yeah. But my, my way of expressing why we don't want to do it yeah. is by looking into the future and saying this is what will happen if we do that. Yeah. This will be a terrible, terrible disaster. And I can express that yeah. without saying that the rocks have a spirit and the trees have a spirit uh, and, and, the, and the world has a, has a spirit. Yeah. So we end up agreeing, though we use different language for doing so. Yeah. Only problem what you are saying in that is The problem with that approach is that uh, we end up taking care of the earth and not polluting the oceans and cutting down the forest because of the fear of some kind. Uh, because we are afraid of global warming or we are afraid of the end of human civilization or something like that. Whereas if you have a spiritual attitude towards the universe, then you take care of the earth not because of the fear of the end of the world or end of civilization, but because of a kind of love and respect for the earth. So this is why I say that um, a kind of spiritual outlook, the word, I, I like the word. I think language is very important. And if we lose the word spiritual from our language, the language will become impoverished. Therefore, I don't want to lose the word spiritual from our English language. I'm with you on the respect and on the love. I don't want to do it out of fear. I want to do it out of love yeah. and respect. Yeah. I worry about spiritual, though, mm. because that suggests to me something supernatural, um, almost superstitious. Um, is there a danger that you'll be misunderstood to be talking about something supernatural, sort of magical? I hope not, because uh, supernatural is not the same as spiritual. Okay. Supernatural or superstitious means that you are living in some kind of delusion, some kind of, uh, kind of make-up thing, made-up thing. Whereas when I say spiritual, I mean that we, we don't only look at the, uh, at the surface on the superficial level, but we look at the level of the meaning. When you bring the meaning into your uh, understanding and into your uh, dialogue, uh, and your discourse, then it becomes a bigger and, and a broader discourse. Whereas if you limit it to just the physical protection, then it is limited. But it is not supernatural, because everything is natural. Whatever is born and whatever will decay is natural. So we are natural. Human beings are nature too. Nature is not out there. The trees and the rivers and the mountains are nature and human beings are not nature. We are nature too. Because anything and everything which is born and which will decay and die is natural. So we are born and we will die, therefore we are natural. So there's nothing in supernatural or supranatural or superstitious in spiritual. Spiritual only looks at the quantitative and qualitative aspects of reality. And that's a holistic. There are lots of people who would use the word spiritual to imply something non-physical and so they would say that something that there's something in humans and perhaps in other animals which say survives their death whereas a rock doesn't have that and and you seem to be by uniting rocks with uh, with humans and other animals um, uh, well I mean I would agree with you but <laughs> insofar as both of them are, are natural and not supernatural yeah, yeah. but you seem to be using a, a a word that most, almost everybody, I think, would take to be a supernatural word, a word like spiritual. Yeah, I, I hope not, because I don't subscribe to something superstitious and supernatural. I subscribe to something because uh, human beings have a kind of relationship between each other. In the same way, we need to have a relationship with the natural world. And what is that relationship? Relationship is based in some values. Relationship in itself is a value. Now, that relationship cannot be reduced to a material idea. 
so my emphasis on the relationship and the quantity and quality aspect rather than just the material aspect. But if it's not material, then what is it? I thought you were just you just said that you only believe in the, in the natural and, and not the supernatural. Yeah. If there's something which is not material, what, what is it? The, the quality of material is spiritual. Right. Quality. Yes. Quality is not material. So supernatural does not mean um, that uh, spiritual is not natural. Because nature has spirit. This is what I said. The trees have spirit, rocks have spirit. So it's not supernatural. Nature without spirit cannot exist. Like a tree cannot exist without the sunlight. It cannot exist without rain. It cannot exist without soil. Also, it cannot exist without the tree-ness. The tree-ness is the spiritual quality. Or the, uh, or the rockness. Or the rockness. Yes. Or the humanness. Yes. So that is-ness. The, 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 what is it? What is it? What it makes, what it is. The whole, that is-ness, is not supernatural. It is part of natural. It is, without spirit, there can be nature, no nature. Yes. Natural, nature, natural spirit, nature spirit, you can call it. I've always had a lot of trouble understanding that isness business. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. When you talk about the rockness or the quality of a rock, uh, I can see as a scientist a rock has hardness and things like that, but I think that's not quite what you mean. Um, it sounds as though what you do mean is something imposed by the human observer who somehow perceives or, or imposes this, this quality of, of rockness. It's not inherent in the rock. No, it is, uh, it is uh, inherent. There is an intrinsic quality in the rock. There is an intrinsic quality in the rock and that intrinsic quality we can understand. Some may understand more fully than others, but it is not imposed, it is there. And only thing we can do is observe and through our observation understand. So understanding quality of a rock is not imposition of the quality on the rock, it is just understanding. Like uh, you want to know a person before you become a friend. You are not imposing your uh, idea of quality on your friend. You know that person, you understand that person, and you appreciate that person. So in the same way, that intrinsic quality, the intrinsic spirit of rock has to be understood by us. And some of us may understand better than others. We cannot all be at the same level of understanding in the same way as not all scientists are at the same level of understanding uh, the science, in the same way all, not all religious people are at the same level of understanding uh, religious principles. So in that way, different people may understand the spirit of the rock at a different level, but the spirit is intrinsic and inha innate and inherent in the rock. And it's was not there imposition. in rocks before there was anybody to appreciate absolutely, it? Absolutely, okay. absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Right. That, Absolutely. That, that means that there is something supernatural because a rock has no... Spirit. We're not going to get anywhere. No, no. I, I say to you <laughs> that spirit is Different natural. Spirit I, I is I, inherent and natural. Hmm. You are standing there as a human being. You have intrinsic spiritual qualities of c compassion, hmm. of friendship, I of relationship. Huh? I That's, call them spiritual. They are spiritual. What would you call them? There are two compassion. words, material and spiritual. Compassion, I would call them. The in, the, that, uh, yeah, but that is invisible quality is spiritual, and visible quality is physical. That's it's, how. It's, it's not invisible once I act on it. I mean, it, 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 then it doesn't become. It, it, for me, doing is more important than any kind of thinking. If I'm compassionate to somebody, then it becomes visible. Yeah, but only visible, only. No, no. Yeah, intellectually, maybe you can say this is compassion, but yeah. as a person, you are compassionate even when you are not expressing your compassion to anybody. Still, that intrinsic quality is there. It's not imposed by me on you. 
It's there. You have it. And when you act upon it, I understand it. I mean, I can see that there are qualities in human beings that remain there, and even though they're not being acted upon, I can see that that's different with a human being. But the rock or a tree, it hasn't got anything other it than it, it hasn't. Has. It's not conscious. Is, it's not. This is how our minds are conditioned to think that spirit is a human domain and human monopoly. I, I it is so not. Let, let, let me have a minute. Yeah. yeah. Um, the rock we know as scientists has mm. a crystalline structure yeah. and there are molecules, yeah. atoms, yeah. with a certain spacing in, yeah. the, in, in the crystal. And we know about the, um, the, 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 the energy in the, in the nucleus of the atom and so yeah. on. Um, but to say that it's spiritual mm. implies that there's something like, say, the spirit of a human when they're in love mm. or when they're angry. Mm. Um, and it's misleading and confusing to, to use the word for a rock, which un unless you really think that rocks have feelings uh, like being loving and angry and, and hurt and things like no, that. No, 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 no. The rock spirit is not the same as the human spirit. But a rock is crystals. A rock is, a rock is, 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 but, is but atoms. But there is a rock quality in the rock. Well, you, th that's a matter of assertion. I mean, you, you are now simply asserting that. Asserting, I'm understanding it. This is my yeah. understanding. Okay. This is my understanding. Yeah. The rock has an intrinsic quality. And that intrinsic quality is irrespective of human interpretation or human understanding or human knowledge. Irrespective of it. Like a flower in the forest is beautiful. Even if nobody has gone to see it, Nobody has ever photographed it, nobody has ever appreciated, yet that flower is there, beautiful. That beauty in itself is intrinsic quality of the flower. In the same way, the rock has its own intrinsic spirit, yeah. and that is there. Well, I think we better just leave it at that, yeah, and, yeah, and you, yeah. got, you had another... I, uh, I mean, to me, that gives it away, because that, that beauty is always in the eye of the beholder. No, no, it is not. It is not. <laughs> it is not. <laughs> okay. Beauty is intrinsic. No, it isn't. It is, it is. It's not we, in the eyes of the whole thing. Yes, it is. No, it is. Yes, it is. No, it is. <laughs> no, it is. Okay, I mean, I'm really interested to know. I'm really interested to know because how do you know this? Huh? How do you know this? How do you know it? Yeah. Tell, tell Reg. Yeah. How do you know I, it? I, that's what I, mean, I meant when, when I said you keep asserting it. I mean, how, how do you know your assertion is right? I don't know okay. that my assertion is right. This is my understanding. This is my worldview. We have a worldview. And, and we shape the world according to that view. And we have to make a sense of the world. If we don't have a world view, and if we don't make a sense of the world, then we cannot relate to the world. So how I relate to the world depends on me. What I say is that my assertion, or my world view, that rock has spirit, flower has spirit, trees have spirit, that will give us a different kind of outlook towards nature. And that outlook will be more benign to the earth. If you have a spiritless, dead earth, dead rock, dead trees, they have no spirit, they are just matter, that will give you a different worldview. And that worldview will lead to a more destructive... No, it won't. <laughs> that's my view. That's, that's my view. understanding. Okay, it's yeah. not mine. This is, this is what has happened. I know it in is. The, in the Western yes. world, we have always believed that earth is a dead. I believe I'm as passionate as you in, in, yeah. in loving l living things and yeah. wanting to save them and stop yeah. them, stopping them going extinct and things like yeah. that. Um, it's not, I don't think they're dead. I mean, you, you said they were dead because they're, they have no spirit. They're not dead. They're alive. They're alive in the sense that science understands them alive. I want to keep them alive. And I, if, if I want to save rocks, I mean, I want to save the Grand Canyon. I want to save mountains. I want to save yeah. rocks in that sense. Yeah. Um, but I don't think that the reason I want to save them is because they have a spirit. But I think we can march together, we can walk together yeah. um, to save the world, yeah. we, although with perhaps different philosophies for the reason why. Yeah. Now, can I just raise one final question, yeah. Yeah. which is um, the problem of, of humility mm. and science. And I think you've written somewhere or said somewhere that science is insufficiently humble. Would you like to, to develop that? Uh, because science has seen the earth as a kind of um, separate object. And the moment you see a separate object, you manipulate the object to suit your purpose. So the history of science in the last 
100 to 200 years has been mostly manipulating the objects of natural world to suit the human needs. That I would consider as an arrogant uh, view, an arrogant science. So I would like to see an ecological humility in which science says my mind is always open, I've never closed my mind, I'm humble and I appreciate and respect the natural world and I'm searching, my mind is not closed. Quite often scientists say this is it, this is the latest theory, uh, until we don't know any theory, this is the final theory, this is, this is where we have reached. The moment you close your mind, that's arrogance. The moment you keep your mind open and say, even there may be spirit in the, I'm searching for it, I'm looking for it, I'm trying to understand it. If I find a theory which proves that a rock has spirit and trees have spirit, I'll accept it. That will be a humility, that will be an openness of the mind. The moment a scientist says, no spirit does not exist, how do you know? We don't know. You, are, you have not yet found, you have not yet maybe understood, you have not yet maybe found a theory of the spirit. So until you find it, you believe what you are believing, but one day there may be a different theory. Before the theory of evolution, people did not know that there was evolution. That did not mean that evolution did not exist. Before the theory of uh, uh, gravity, people did not know that there was gravity. But that did not mean that gravity does not exist. In the same way, today, scientists don't know that there's a spirit in the rock. But that does not mean that in 10 or 20 or 50 or 200 years, there will be no new theory where scientists will come up with the idea that rocks are alive and have a spirit and have beauty and have intrinsic value. I want to be open-minded. Exactly. Uh, exactly. <laughs> but I, I suspect that... And you're absolutely right that there are going to be things that we will discover in the future that we couldn't possibly dream of today. Exactly. But I'm willing to bet you that the idea that rocks have a spirit is not going to be one of them. It'll be something much grander how, and bigger than that. How can you bet that? Well, I can bet it because I don't think we're using the word in a precise way. I, I, I think that it, it doesn't even mean anything to say a rock has a spirit, I, I suspect. And therefore, I, I'm, not, I'm not that interested in that. I, I am interested in agreeing with you that we have to be humble and open-minded yeah. to all the things that are but, going to come in the future that we don't yet but understand. But you are contradicting yourself. On the one hand, you say you want to be open and humble, but before that you said, but you expect it is not going to be ever spiritual. You have closed your mind. Well, I, I meant you are contradicting what I, yourself. What I meant to say is that, <laughs> is that I don't think the word spirit is being used in a sufficiently precise way that we could ever know whether the proposition was true or not. But I do want to agree with you that we must be open-minded and humble and be aware that there's an enormous amount that we don't yet understand. Fine. And it will be grander and bigger than anything that we can yet imagine. I'm delighted. <laughs> I'm delighted to Thank hear you very that. much Thank indeed. You. Thank okay. you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.